Hi, this is Michael Adams for Stock Telegraph and CEO Roaster. And um, just recently, I published um, some postings on Twitter, Facebook, and the like um, because I wanted to get your questions for Palladium One Mining. Um, it's trading um, as PDM on the TSX Venture. Um, also, it's trading in Frankfurt, and I will have the um, trading parameters somewhere around this video. And the reason that um, I wanted to touch base with uh, Derek Weirauch is. Um, yeah, that uh, there have been some developments with the company and I just wanted to get some details and you guys, thank you very much. You supp um, supplied some of the questions and let's just dig into it. Yeah, one of the question was um, brought to me by Cuckoo 1982 and it was, what's the impact of the lockdown? How long do you assume it's gonna last? Is there a difference between Finland and the other projects in Ontario? So Derek, thanks for taking the time and up to you. Oh, good to talk to you, Michael. Um, so the uh, the impact of COVID-19, we certainly have been impacted by it. It, it caused us to uh, shut down exploration activities in Finland in uh, the middle of March. We were drilling uh, and uh, However, you know, we were able to get a lot of the work done that we had uh, previously planned. And maybe what I can show you here on the screen is, is a little bit of what our planning was for this year and, and how it impacted us. So when we when we got into 2020, our intention was to de-risk an exploration drilling program by doing a fair amount of geophysics in advance of uh, drilling. And the plan was to do about 75 line kilometers of induced polarization IP on five different survey grids, as you can see on the uh, the chart here on the on the bottom right hand side. The uh, five survey grids are outlined in blue. As well, we were looking at doing about 385 uh, line kilometers of uh, drone-based uh, high-resolution uh, magnetics. Fortunately, uh, before the shutdown of uh, COVID, uh, we were able to get all of that work done, as well as drilling just under 2,000 meters of, uh, of diamond drilling uh, of a 5,000 meter drilling program. So uh, we, uh, we got a lot of work done, but did shut down. We have been able to release some of the uh, the results um, into the market. Uh, three of the five uh, survey grids have been released. Uh, the samples for drilling are still with the labs. They obviously uh, slowed down quite a bit as a result of this, and it took us a little bit of time to get the samples prepped and, and uh, sent to the lab. We're hoping to uh, to get the assay results back uh, in the next couple of weeks and uh, hopefully we can get it into the market by the end of, uh, of May. So uh, although it's not ideal, uh, we got a bunch of work done and, and hope to get back into uh, exploration uh, and drilling uh, later on this summer. But uh, right now we don't have a firm date. We are just playing it by ear. Uh, listening to and uh, talking to the local authorities. And, um, you know, obviously there's going to be some flight restrictions currently. So uh, we're waiting for that to clear up. Okay, great. And you know, there's with, with regards to the... Yeah. No, sorry, sorry go, go, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just trying to sneak a question in from Chris. Um, he was asking about the monthly maintenance costs for the Finland projects during the lockdown. Is there any number you can share? Well, well, nothing has really changed in terms of the maintenance costs. The way this system works in Finland, there are annual, um, let's call it claims fee or maintenance fees that have to be paid. They're based on how many hectares of land you have. We currently have a cost of roughly $225,000 Canadian oh. per year. And uh, so far, the government has not uh, given any uh, consideration to a reduced uh, rate uh, as a result of COVID. And um, you know, people should know that those fees actually get paid directly to the underlying landowners and aren't actually a, t a tax that goes to the uh, to the state. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, so then, so, then move, move on. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, for those of you that uh, are familiar with the story, we've put together a few slides here to uh, just give you our perspective of of the results we have. You know, here uh, we are zooming in on the top part of the property up in the Kakua area where we have the Kakua resource. We've got about 30,000 meters of drilling 
and roughly a 1.2 million ounce palladium equivalent resource in the solid uh, yellow oval. Uh, we did uh, know when we when we put that resource together last September that there were a number of holes, about five or six, just south of the resource where the uh, the arrow indicates there, and that area did not make it into the resource, and, and we called it uh, the Kakua South area. And because those holes had some good uh, mineralization, as you can see there, we've got uh, one gram of uh, PGs plus uh, copper and nickel. It became a, a very interesting area for us. And we do know that going to the east it, inside of that dashed line along the contact, there's been very little exploration activity. So part of our decision for the current year was to make that a, a key area to uh, to do geophysics in order to understand where there may be higher concentrations of uh, chargeability anomalies, where we could point the uh, the drill bit to. So we did a, a, a geophysics grid over that area. It's roughly a little over four kilometers in in size. And as well on the top of the map up at Murto Lampy, we also uh, did a geophysics grid there where the, uh, the dashed outline is. And largely in part, th that was due to the historic drilling activity that was done back in the uh, the 1990s by Autocampo and GTK that we show on the top left where you know they did very shallow holes about 40 meters in depth uh, they were mineralized it was a fence of about 200 meters long and when we were there last summer you'll recall us talking about a, a chip sample that we got at surface after walking around for a couple hours we got over three grams of pges and 0.8 uh, percent uh, copper so very uh, great good values and uh, we conducted a survey there so what you see on the left hand side in the um, box called mertilampi uh, plan map is uh, the results that we announced a few weeks ago for the the IP survey grid. And you can see that we've got a fairly large anomaly there. It's up to perhaps 350, 400 meters in width. It runs about 750 meters in uh, in length. And we also see in that map the, uh, the drill holes and the intercepts from uh, GTK back in the 1990s. And you can see that they didn't actually uh, hit the anomaly. They were in the area, but th but they didn't hit it. So, you know, given there's a uh, good mineralization there, uh, we're very excited. Uh, we were able to this year drill one hole in that area. We set up close to the, uh, the, uh, the former holes and uh, drilled underneath the uh, the anomaly. But we're really excited to get back into uh, that area and follow up uh, just a whole uh, a bunch of uh, of good news that really is, is an underexplored area. You know, if, if this was sitting in North America, it would have been drilled out uh, quite a long time ago. But the big news that really drove our stock price a couple of weeks ago back up to about uh, 12 cents per share was the, uh, the southern zone below Kakua there. And you know, there we we released the uh, the following uh, results from the IP, and as you can see on the left hand side, the uh, the IP work done in 2008 um, was a fairly small survey. We have on the top left the outline of the Kikua pit. It's approximately in one kilometer of strike length, and as I said earlier, it contains that 1.2 million ounces. Whereas this anomaly on the southern part now is over four kilometers in size, we have the historical drilling on the far western side of it that shows very good grade. You know, as I said, over one gram uh, per ton PGEs. So, you know, we've got an exciting opportunity, and the, the big question in our mind is uh, how many more Kakuas do we have in this, uh, you know, four kilometer strike length that we know has mineralization on the on the left hand side. So really pleased about that and uh, you know very much demonstrates the fact that this is very much a drilling exercise um, in order to build the uh, the tonnage and uh, and the resources okay the other uh, survey the third survey that we put out into the market last week was down on the southern part in the hakiaho area on the top uh, map here you can it's an aerial view you can see that we identified three main corridors which we call the western drill target the central drill target and then the uh, the eastern the historical 
resource that was done back in 2013 was on the that uh, that western area but it was very widely spaced and needed a lot of infill drilling to uh, take it into a, a proper pit constrained uh, resource and our objective this year was to drill that out and perhaps uh, drill 2000 to 2500 meters in order to get sufficient uh, drill density to turn that into a resource and our hope was to add about a million ounces to our, our resource base. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we were unable to, uh, to do so. But these um, results from the IP are extremely encouraging. You can see here, there's a, a very large anomaly there. So it looks to be a little bit deeper. They might've even missed it at depth. Um, so that's exciting as well as the, uh, the anomalies to the, uh, to the east. So we're very much looking forward to getting back at, uh, at Hakiaho. But um, I think given the, uh, the terrain uh, at uh, Myrtolampi and Kakua South is fairly elevated, we'll probably uh, be focusing there before coming back to Hakiaho, which we would hope to do in, in the winter. Okay. And the other bit of update uh, this year is a little program we did on our Tyco project in, uh, in Ontario. The way the uh, the land tenure system works in uh, in Canada, you have to do a minimum amount of work to maintain your properties in in good standing. And given uh, the LK in Finland and PGEs are our primary focus, uh, we didn't really want to spend a lot of money uh, at Tyco. So we did a small program of uh, soil sampling across a historical airborne EM uh, target and. Uh, that target had been confirmed back in 2016 with a VLF survey that um, that outlined a 300 meter long um, uh, anomaly. So okay. the the sampling that we did in that area in the fall announced in January showed a background uh, elevation for um, for mineralization greater than 22 times. Uh, what you would uh, expect to see. And it's really a classical uh, signature for a massive sulfide uh, deposition. So it, it changed the uh, the orientation and our thinking here because um, you know massive sulfides with the tenor that we're seeing historically at uh, Tyco is quite high. Could be very valuable uh, rock, and it's very well outlined. So our uh, our next steps as far as Tyco is concerned is to just do a small ground-based uh, EM survey, uh, a little bit broader, in order to really define exactly where that uh, plate might uh, might be, and uh, do a small program of drilling, perhaps 2,000 meters, in order to uh, to target and see exactly what we have there. But it's a very interesting opportunity. Uh, I think we're being a little bit opportunistic. Uh, right now, because we are in the process of doing a small uh, a fundraising, a flow through fundraising to uh, to do that activity. And the reason we're doing it is because uh, exploration in Ontario is deemed to be a, an essential service. Oh, I just got to turn on my uh, plug in my battery. Um, <laughs> Not a good thing, but um, exploration is, is deemed an essential service. So uh, we have the ability to go in and, and it is something that we could uh, probably drill uh, this summer. Yeah, let me let me cut so, into this uh, because I, I have a question. Please. I have a couple of questions regarding the financing. So let me just cut into this. Um, one of the questions is from Investor Legend 333 um, and it's regarding the flow through placement. Says, is your is your focus now shifting to the projects in Ontario? Is this focus solely based on the impact of 19 and the lockdown, especially on the uh, projects in Finland? Um, because the Ontario projects are primary nickel, not palladium. Are you shifting your focus to palladium uh, to to nickel? What activities are you planning in detail on the Ontario projects? And yeah, that's kind of his thoughts. So can you comment on that? Yeah, there's a few questions in there, and I think I touched on a couple of them. Uh, we're yeah. only looking at uh, the the uh, the Smoke Lake anomaly, and we're looking at doing a very small program. 
opportunistically because we have the ability to get into the field and add some value. Our focus remains uh, Finland and LK in particular and in the uh, in the palladium space. This is something where, quite frankly, there's some low-hanging fruit here, and we believe that with uh, spending a little bit amount of uh, money, we should be able to add uh, quite a bit of value to uh, to this project and uh, and position it for um, for next phase. But uh, our focus does remain uh, Finland and PGs. Okay. Is there, and that's a question for me, is there any thoughts about polishing up the Tyco project and maybe spinning it out, or didn't you put some thoughts into this yet? Well, that's part of what we're doing here with the polishing up, is uh, positioning ourselves to be able to do that spin out. Um, okay. We have the ability to dividend out um, Tyco. It is sitting in a separate legal entity to our shareholders so that they can... Uh, or so that we can realize, you know, value for what we have in uh, in the Tyco project, which right, right now is being obscured based on our focus on uh, LK. Exactly. That's what I thought. You you don't get any value in the market right now for Tyco, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, maybe I just add uh, because I have some other questions regarding the financing, and we, we because we just talked about that. So um, there's one general question um, from Sturm in Hamburg, <laughs> funny name, which means like a storm in Hamburg. Um, what is a charity placement? Because part of what you do at the flow through is, is, um, is a charge for charity placement. So can you just give us an idea what a charity placement is and what the differences to a regular placement, uh, to a regular flow through placement are? And, and his question is, why should anyone pay 13 cents, which is the price for the charity placement? <laughs> Sure. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll explain it in uh, in two steps. First, uh, for those that aren't familiar with what a flow through uh, financing is, a flow through financing is a tax driven scheme in Canada designed for Canadian investors, and an investor subscribing uh, to the shares will get a tax deduction, income tax deduction for the full amount of their investment. It grinds their cost basis down to zero for tax purposes, but you know if you're in the highest tax bracket and let's say it's 53%, your after-tax cost might be 47%. And that's why when flow-through financings take place, they're at a premium to market because of this, this tax advantage. But obviously, it is not a good form of financing for international investors, such as people in Europe. You know, why would they want to pay a premium? Um, and I, I think it can leave a bad taste in a lot of uh, uh, international investors' mouths if companies constantly do this type of financing. So it, um, it can be counterproductive. Now, in our case, what I want to do is raise only enough money uh, for what we want to accomplish and minimize dilution and minimize the overhang on the stock. So there's a, a enhanced tax scheme, if you will, called a charity flow scheme. And in that situation, what happens is an investor or a donor, if you will, will subscribe to shares in this case at 13 cents and because that individual wants to make a, a charitable contribution to a hospital for example they will subscribe for the shares immediately turn around and donate them to the hospital and the hospital will immediately sell them to what i term a, a back-end uh, buyer and the reason this works is because that donor is able to give value to the hospital. The donor not only gets the tax deduction or the full amount of the investment, they also get a charitable tax receipt, which reduces their cost base that much more and allows them to uh, to donate even more to charity because instead of costing them 13 cents on an after-tax basis, their contribution might only be Four, uh, four cents, four or five cents, somewhere around there. Um, the charity loves it because they actually get a donation and they can then sell the uh, the underlying shares or, or units and they sell them at a discount to market. And as a result of that, 
sale, uh, anybody can acquire those shares. And it's so it's an ideal construct for an international investor to be able to partake in a situation where the company is raising money well above market, minimizing dilution, minimizing overhang, but allowing the uh, the investor to to buy the back end of that financing at a slight discount to market in order to uh, to participate in the scheme and advance the company. Okay, but and let me ask under you. both. Yeah. So let me ask you, the back end investor, because the the shares are restricted, so they are not like trading on the on the stock exchange. So how does like the back end investor uh, purchase? Is that like a private agreement with the hospital in your case, or how does he get his shares? Well, it's it's no different than a non-brokered uh, private placement. Uh, the shares do are the exact same shares as any other shares that the company has outstanding. And they will be on a four month hold. Uh, yep. So they, they can't trade for four months, but they're no different. And they, you know, the back end buyer would get the same um, certificate or uh, registration that they would on any other uh, shares. Okay. The only difference is that they don't get the tax deduction, but they don't care because they don't need it in any event. Okay, so the advantage for the company is that you just can raise uh, uh, money at a higher price and and limit uh, dilution, right? Correct. Correct. Okay, good. Okay, good. Uh, and the rest is probably not as interesting for the German audience because, as you said, yeah, like they can't really participate in the flow through. Uh, although, um, all well, no, on the ch on the charity, the back end, they can participate because they're assisting the company getting. Um, a higher price or more money in and they get themselves a, a discount to market. Yeah, I get it. And the other good thing about flow through, yeah, it might have some uh, other implications, but the good th uh, thing about flow through is you have to put that money into the ground, right? It's not for general business purposes. So so it's, it's for sure to advance the company, the fundamentals, right? It, well, it's absolutely has to, uh, meet certain criteria for exploration the money has to be spent in canada so for example i mentioned earlier there's a minimum amount of spending that has to happen for a canadian project and you know we use the term having flow through money if you, if you have flow through money and you can do that minimum spend with flow through that's the preferred mechanism versus what we term um, hard dollars. So the money that we raised, for example, to advance LK in Finland is hard dollars. It's not flow yep. through eligible. And therefore, we, it doesn't make a lot of sense to use those dollars invest in exploration in Ontario when I can minimize dilution by raising flow through monies for Ontario. No, that totally makes sense. And um, so, there's another question coming in from Harold M, um, also talking about the financing. How is the market response to your recent, uh, recently announced $1.15 million flow through placement? When can we expect closing? And um, are, is there any participation of institutions? Yeah, there's uh, institutional participation both on the uh, the conventional flow as well as the uh, the charity flow, and okay. we would hope to uh, be closing it next week. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so other... we're you know if if we can get it done on the 18th, that would be great. Okay. Cool. Um, quick other question coming in, or that came in from Alexander um, regarding uh, the participation in, of, of Eric Sprott in the um, financing last year. So is, is Sprott still on board? Is he still a big supporter of the company? Yeah, he's very much uh, still a supporter. As a matter of fact, I was just checking uh, yesterday uh, the uh, regulatory reporting that he needs to uh, to follow to see if he's changed his position at all. And uh, there's been no change, so he he continues to be uh, holding everything he bought. Okay, good, good. So I think that's oh no, there's one one other question left which which was supplied to me. And it's a more general question. So maybe we, we end up with this. Um, do you have anything um, that you want to go through on your side? Or should I just finish up with the last question from Matty? 
Well, no, I, I think uh, we hit the key points that I wanted to hit, which was an exploration update, the impact of, uh, of COVID, and as I said earlier, with regards to that, you know, we don't know exactly when we're going to get back into the field. We're hoping, uh, you know, in the next couple of months. But, you know, from a strategic perspective, and I think it's important for investors to understand how we think strategically, you know, we, we do have a strong cash position now that allows us the ability to get back into uh, to Finland and, and complete the, uh, the program. And hopefully we can get that done. We have a backlog of news flow. But as you see, we are releasing uh, updates to the market. Um, as, as we get the data processed and it's not going to be too many more weeks until we have also uh, released to the market the uh, the drilling results. So, you know, one of the things I was very conscious of is that we're going to run out of ca catalysts to support the stock at a point in time over the next little while and without understanding when we could get back to exploration and support and drive the stock through news flow, thought it was important to take advantage of the uh, the essential service situation in Ontario and the fact that we have this drill ready target at Smoke Lake so we can have additional catalysts to support the stock right through the uh, the end of the summer. Yeah. No, I I think it's uh it's a total um good way that you guys yeah yeah I I can I can figure out you you put some thoughts into it right because you're right now you're limited in Finland but you still have the projects in Ontario um you are wise and not uh, enough uh, not to waste waste in paragraphs the um the hard dollars yeah which are supposed to go into the Finland project not to waste them in paragraphs on the on the Ontario project raise a little bit more money yeah with with a, a low dilution yeah based on the flow through and charity flow through placement um so that all makes sense to me um and i, I i'm happy to yeah whenever we really start moving again we just hook up again um, to, that you can give me an update. And I would like to finish off with the question from Mati. And he's he's commenting that palladium's main use is in car catalysts. What if due to the changes in the overall demand for cars due to the coronavirus and maybe the, the impacts later on, yeah, like limited mobility and everything, will lead to a way of less car sales in the future? Is there any other significant application for palladium outside the car manufacturing industry? Derek? Well, that is an excellent question that we could probably spend an hour on. Um, <laughs> you know, the reality is that we saw with uh, COVID in uh, early March that the c new car sales in China uh, dry dried up quite a bit. I think they were down about 92% in, uh, in February, and it's only recently that the assembly plants have reopened up. And uh, both in China and, uh, and the announcements in, uh, in North America and in Europe, Prior to COVID, it was very clear that there was no solution to the supply deficit that's been running for about eight years and that additional resources in good jurisdictions were needed. And, you know, last year, I believe the the number was about 9.7 million ounces was uh, consumed in the automotive catalyst, whereas the global mine supply was only about 6.9 million ounces, so 40% premium. And the expected deficit in 2020 and 2021 etc was expected to continue as a matter of fact accelerate as a result of ongoing um, more stringent uh, environmental standards coming to uh, to bear so for example in china the uh, china 6a standard only comes into uh, effect in uh, in july of this year which is going to cause even more loading of vehicles so, you know, fundamentals for the market are extremely constructive. Um, the reality is, I think at this juncture, we don't know exactly what the impact is going to be on new vehicle sales and the uh, the impact on the deficit. Certainly, we also saw a lot of supply curtailment. So the South African mines shut down 100% for a period of time. I believe they're currently back up to about 50% capacity. And you've got over 40% of uh, palladium supply globally coming from South Africa. So it's a really big hit to already a fairly small market. 
We've seen impacts in uh, in Ontario, for example, Lactazeal, one of the very rare palladium dominant uh, mines, was shut down for a period of time due to COVID. So there is an interplay between um, demand changing and supply changing, and we'll have to see how this plays out. And you know, part of the question uh, was, are there other uses for palladium? Certainly there are. Um, palladium is is part of that um, precious metal suite, so it has been uh, used as an investment vehicle for some time. There are dental applications, chemical industrial applications, but realistically at this point in time, it is consumed for the, uh, the auto catalyst. You know, there is research uh, that it is being conducted that uh, palladium is going to play an absolutely critical role in the uh, the hydrogen economy as we move to fuel cells because just like it has unique properties to clean uh, emissions in the auto catalyst those unique properties can also be exploited in uh, in hydrogen um, energy and uh, a zero emission environment so you know i would anticipate that um, there, there's going to be an impact i don't know what it's going to be but uh, there's a long-term future just because it's a very unique metal that has a number of different uh, properties that make it special and important for reducing uh, in environmental uh, damage. Okay, cool. So yeah. I would like to say thank you very much for taking the time to give us an update on, um, on the company developments, the, the situation right now. And also, uh, especially uh, answering the questions of my subscribers and viewers. So thank you very much, Derek. Um, also, let me suggest that whenever we are moving forward, yeah, like this, this crisis has been kind of uh, solved, I would say, uh, and every, everything is like moving forward, like operational wise, you can, you can restart on the uh, projects in Finland, or you might have some results from the projects in Ontario. Um, just let me know. I will be happy to host another, um, interview session with you. And uh, in the meantime, thank you very much and, um, good luck and stay healthy. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your interest. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's stay in touch. I look forward to uh, getting back in, into the field and uh, and, and driving some uh, drill bits. Great. Thanks, Derek. Take care. Bye bye. Thank, thank you.